I'd like to int uh, introduce our first guest for the inaugural Moody Women in Aviation Week, Air Force retired Lieutenant Colonel Carrie Worth Zimmerman. Carrie has over 20 years of experience as an aviator and has flown as a combat mission ready pilot in five different aircraft, including the HC-130 here at Moody Air Force Base. And she's accumulated over 4,800 flight hours. Now retired, Carrie is a commercial aviator flying full-time for UPS. And she's also a co-founder of the Mill U Project, which aims to increase opportunities for young girls and other minorities to pursue careers in aviation. So welcome, Carrie. Thanks for being with us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So you've clearly had a long and successful career in aviation. When did you first know you wanted to fly? Oh, I would say I, I was one of those kids that was lucky. I knew exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I was seven years old and having a conversation with my mom and dad because we were getting ready to go to an air show. I grew up in Southeastern Wisconsin. So Oshkosh is pretty close. And I just looked at my parents and said I wanted to be a pilot. But what they distinctly remember was this shy kid who couldn't even order her own meal at McDonald's at a career day where being from Wisconsin, the Milwaukee Brewers were coming to visit our small grade school. And they asked everybody what they wanted to be when they grew up and my hand shot up to which even the other parents in the gym were looking around like, is Carrie gonna speak? And my hand shut up and I said, I'm going to go to the Air Force Academy and I'm going to be a pilot. So that was the first time it was said out loud. I don't remember this event. <laughs> it's uh, said to me. So when I get asked when I first knew, apparently I knew when I was seven. I just don't remember saying this out loud to my parents or in front of everybody, this kid that never spoke up. And once I said that, I started, I remember then following the following events. I remember going to more air shows with my dad. I remember trying to read as much as I could and to date myself. That was before I could go Google aviation or military flying on the internet. And it was trying to go out and search things. And when I really knew I could do it was one summer at Oshkosh at the, at the fly-in. My parents had taken me and we were watching this pilot fly these aerobatics that just looked death defying to me. And after the show, that part of the show was done, walking up to the area where the aircraft were parking and Patty Wagstaff got out of the airplane. So I had said it before, I knew it was something I might be interested in doing. No one knows where I got Air Force Academy into my brain, but I remember that day at Oshkosh seeing Patty Wagstaff and I looked at my dad, and went, I'm gonna be a pilot. So that's that started it. Oh my gosh. So you ended up going to the Air Force Academy, right? I did. I, that, that was a long story in itself. There was a whole, like my dad, you know, my mom and dad supported me, but they had to look at me and go, well, there are some things that you're, you're going to have to start working harder if this is what you want to do. And I usually use that as an example, talking to girls who are, I'm not really good at math or I'm shy. I get told I'm too quiet. It's there is not one specific group or type of person that is good at A, B, or C. That means you're gonna be a great pilot or a great officer or a great mechanic or a great engineer. It's, do you want to? So I just learned that I'm gonna to have to work harder at a few things because I probably am not quite meeting the mark with what I said. I want to go to the Air Force Academy and be a pilot. So the concept of going to the Air Force Academy, wow, that was daunting to a seven-year-old once I realized it was really involved in getting there. But I had my parents to tell me I needed to work harder. <laughs> it's probably good advice for everybody. <laughs> well, I needed to work a lot harder. And <laughs> no, but I, I, don't, I don't say that you know too much as a, to discourage people, but anything that you really want to do, it's going to take some hard work because we see often when we're looking at people, we see the end product. So it's really easy to look at somebody who's super successful doing something you want to do or be and going, 
oh, I don't know if I can do that because he or she has this, that, or has done this, but we all started somewhere. And in my case, you know, I started as the shy kid who couldn't order dinner at McDonald's. <laughs> So you said Patty Wagstaff inspired you when you saw her. Is there anyone else who's been an inspiration to you throughout your career? You know, that's, that's a really great question. And that's one that I think changes as you age, as you progress. I know as a kid, it was my parents and their support. It was Patty Wagstaff seeing her get out of that airplane, me just being in shock. Uh, Cause that was the first time I knew girls could be pilots. But it was the first time seeing it. And there's something about that. And then later as I move through my career, um, not all of the people that inspire you tend to be people that support you. So I had a few instructors in pilot training who weren't the most supportive. I had many that were, I would say the majority were, but my inspiration to be better and do better was to get these particular instructors to have to leave me alone. And as I grow older, I look back at those two instructors and now I recognize it's not that they weren't supporting me. They just recognized those things I needed to work harder at, made note of my personality trait and were addressing me in a manner that they knew was going to inspire me to do better. So I would say as you go along your career, you start recognizing how somebody that you felt was well, that's a person's inspiring me to work hard because I just want them to leave me alone. Now I'm 45 years old, looking back going, oh, they had me pegged. Um, <laughs> another one is, um, you, I mentioned when you brought up my going to the Air Force Academy, my sponsor family. So when you go to the Air Force Academy, you get assigned a sponsor family. And I was still, even though I had achieved where I wanted to go to school, still that shy girl from small town Wisconsin. So I was homesick, terribly homesick, even though it was exactly where I wanted to be. And my sponsor family, the, the dad was a retired Air Force colonel and he had worked in the admissions department there. And just every single time I would get either, I don't know, I don't wanna say unmotivated because you keep your, you keep your motivation. He was just one of those people that stayed there to remind me of why I was there. He's like, you're homesick because you have people you miss. You're not homesick because you don't belong here. You're tired because you're working hard to achieve something. You're not tired because you don't have what it takes to be here. So listening and watching him was incredibly inspiring to me and got me, got me through those four years. And like I said, it changes as you progress. By the time I retired from the military, the people that inspired me were everyone I worked with getting to see that young lieutenant or that young airman figuring out their career when they have the moment of this is what I want to be doing and sharing it with others. You know, you, you start to be able to sit back and watch that and just be inspired by them to keep going. Cause you know, you, you start to lose your why you start to lose your, you know, your own inspiration of why you started doing something when you hit later in your career and seeing that became really inspiring. So someone like you, watching you go, do, do what you want to do, be what you want to be. So that helps as well. It's interesting perspective from a lieutenant. Hey, it's, <laughs> you know, you're always told to go find a mentor. You're probably told, hey, go find a mentor. Mm -hmm. People like me who were about to pin on Colonel trying to decide if I want to retire or not. You know who I needed as a mentor? I need a lieutenant or a captain or a senior airman or a tech sergeant to sit down. You know, you can mentor up too. So don't forget that. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so you mentioned those two flight instructors in fly school. What aircraft were you learning to fly at the time? I know you were combat mission ready pilot in five. But this one particular pilot training was the T-37. We don't fly it anymore. Uh, we used to call it, I think it was the 6,000 pound dog whistle. <laughs> and I look back at that now and I can't believe that they let a young lieutenant with almost zero experience in an airplane because 
my first time flying was when I got to the Air Force Academy. I never tried it leading up. I just, for some reason, felt it's what I really wanted to do. But they, they let us go fly those things solo. <laughs> Ejection seats and engines. And it was amazing to me. But that was in the T-37. Um, yeah, that was... That was fun. I had a, I had a tendency I could fly the airplane, but I didn't really have the brain to remember all the procedures. So I'm somebody who has to read, reread, read it, and then write it down. Maybe write it down a second time before something gets in my brain. I'm not a natural learner when it comes to reading. I need to see it and then do it. So once I got in the airplane, I was fine once it was taught to me. But that was. T-37s kind of set that, that baseline for me of what I was going to need to do as I progressed and then getting into those five aircraft that I flew as a combat mission ready pilot. What was your favorite aircraft? You're always supposed to say the one I'm currently flying, <laughs> but I would say it's a, the CASA 235, the CN 235. I know the Coast Guard flies a variant of it right now, the CN 295. It's just little twin engine turboprop that is so versatile, it can do just about anything. And it is, it is just fun to fly. It's a pilot airplane. And it, it was in fact, it's in the picture behind me. But it's, uh, I love the C-130. I love the mission I flew in rescue. And if we could find a way to get CASA 235s into the rescue community, I'd be all for it. But it, it was a great plane to fly because it's you, it's another pilot, you have a couple other crew members, but it's just small, versatile airplane, can go anywhere, do almost anything. I enjoyed it. What do you fly now? I fly the Boeing 747, which was a huge... <laughs> I remember sitting in class the first day at UPS going, you do know I'm a turboprop pilot. <laughs> So the transition, I mean, going from, I look at the, the HC-130 and I remember max, you know, I could take off at 185,000 pounds. We typically, you know, the max refueling weight to refuel a helicopter at 155,000 pounds. That's not even my fuel load. <laughs> I mean, I'm watching the fuel loads pump up sometimes on the ground and one of the guys, my instructors goes, oh, we're gonna be a little lightweight today when I'm first getting checked out. I'm like, you do realize our fuel load is twice the max gross takeoff weight of my previous airplane. <laughs> I mean, I took off out of Hong Kong weighing just under a million pounds. Oh my gosh, that's insane. It's, it's insane. We, <laughs> when you take the entire runway to, <laughs> it's a little, <laughs> Are you sure this is good? No, it is a great airplane. The, it is a great airplane. Although it's not, it's not a pilot's airplane. What do you mean by that? I joke that I'm an airplane monitor. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it, it's easy to joke about that, but it's um, the advancements in aviation right now, as far as aircraft design and interface with the pilot, they've added so many things to make our jobs easier that as long as you know how to use the equipment and how it works, so it's still garbage in, garbage out if you don't program things correctly or set them up correctly or try to perform that or use them in outside their performance parameters, but it'll land itself. That's crazy. I still have to make it take off, <laughs> but it will land itself. It will do auto land. Um, you eventually have to disengage that because it won't tax you back to your parking spot, but you can fly as little as you want to in this airplane. I prefer to fly as much as the captain will allow me to right now. So, so they encourage you to fly yes. on your own? Yes, um, they encourage you to fly on your own. Um, I know a lot of the captains I've flown with in the airplane, even though it's highly automated, encourage me to hand fly the airplane up until cruise or to disc and then disconnect the autopilot again at top of descent so I can fly the approach and arrival and landing. They still encourage that because that's a, that's a real concern in the commercial aviation community of that over-reliance on automation. 
that you start losing your stick and rudder skills, as we, we call them, as you start flying more and more in the commercial world. So we do a lot of simulator training and I've always been lucky enough to fly with captains that encourage me to leave the automation for when I really need it and hand fly when I can. Because I have the benefit, of, I don't have any passengers that I'm gonna disrupt. <laughs> That's, don't complain. Just some packages for people? Just some packages. I'll still make sure everything gets there all right, but you know, they're not, nobody back there is noticing if I've made a few too many power adjustments. Right. <laughs> and the level off wasn't very smooth. <laughs> so what was that transition like from being a military aviator to a commercial aviator? The biggest part is the lack of demand on your time. We're so used to, in, a, in the military, being an aviator is like your, it's your primary job when you're younger, but as you grow in the community, you start transitioning to more things take over your time and flying just becomes your, you know, this is my technical skill. And in commercial aviation, your technical skill is your whole job. So that first transition of nothing else was really my responsibility, like filing my flight plan, scheduling my layovers. Um, I was only responsible to get myself to be somewhere at a particular time that they needed me to be there. So in the hotel lobby at 4 a.m. to meet the captain and go over to ops and fly the airplane. My first time landing, um, we do this thing called initial operating experience. It's like your first trip flying the airplane and you do it with a captain who's an instructor. We landed after the first flight and he just walked right to the crew van to go to the hotel and I'm thinking we have to go into ops and debrief. <laughs> I was like, do we, do we need to file any paperwork or do anything or talk about the flight? He's like, there's something you want to talk about? Is, something, is everything okay? And I'm like, no, just, just getting used to this. <laughs> I didn't even have to file paperwork. There's no, there's aircraft forms, but the captain just signs them and leaves them on the airplane with maintenance, the logbook stuff. I'm so used to giving a 781 to the one Charlie Oscars that keep track of all my flight time and events. I'm used to having to fill out events. That's all automated. So which one do you like better? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You know what, I, I miss the other part that is a, a, a big transition is you miss the connection with the people. So I'll still have to say military. You can form those connections. You can talk to the maintenance guys, talk to the loaders, but it's just such a bigger enterprise and it's a commercial enterprise that everybody has their thing to do and it's always on a timeline. Um, so I miss the military, I miss that connection. I miss, you know, Getting, getting called up that I, my landings and my takeoffs are suspicious because the 781 that I filled out, I said I did five and five and the, I somehow logged eight. <laughs> no, I, I, I miss that. I miss the interaction with the people and the crew members and getting to know people. I might fly with a captain, not fly with them again for another year. That's crazy. So you miss that camaraderie a lot. And you'll, you'll probably hear that Anybody that's either separated or retired, we miss the people. I miss the people, not the bureaucracy is the, the standard line. And it sounds so cliche until you're living it. You're like, oh, that's what they meant. That's what they meant. So the military flying. Plus you can't land a 747 in the dirt. <laughs> well, you can do it once. <laughs> it's my job. <laughs> So do you have a favorite story throughout the military or a favorite flight? Oh, I've had so many of them. That's a really good question if I have a favorite one. I would say that my most, my most memorable flight, and this usually goes along with the question of what is the most challenging thing you've ever had to do in the airplane? And it's figure out how to go to the bathroom is my usual standard line. <laughs> it's something, if you think about it, they don't teach you that in pilot training. They don't talk about it in a lot of other training. And it's 
usually because the people instructing you haven't had to do a lot of thought of how are they gonna go to the bathroom? And at least in the C-130, there's a couple of facilities to do that, but neither of them are very useful for a female pilot. So I had this great crew, my first ever deployment and rescue. Um, we're all retired now. I was the last one to retire and the last one hanging on, but we were in Jakobabad, Pakistan, and it was at the beginning of OEF. So beginning of the war in Afghanistan. So this was in early 2003. And we got launched on a alert to go meet up with two H-860s taking out of Kandahar to refuel them and go do something. So you would think that the most challenging part of that flight was gonna be coordinating with the 60s. Where were we gonna do our refueling? You know, challenging weather, challenging terrain in Afghanistan. You had people's lives on the line, but all of that stuff we are trained to do and we love to do. And that whole mission was great. But then I remember as the adrenaline wore off and we're climbing back up and I'm realizing I've got to figure out how to go to the bathroom. And having heard the conversation, the PJ team leader in the back, and this might be, I don't know if we want to keep this story. <laughs> I walked to the back of the cargo compartment and he had cut the top off of his Gatorade bottle and handed it to me because he heard me telling the pilot, I have to figure out how to go to the bathroom because I'm not going to make it back to Jacoba bed. <laughs> Leave it to a PJ. Here's a problem, problem solved. Just took out his bench made, cut the top off and handed it to me. But no, it was my memorable flight for many reasons because as a young captain, I learned two things that day. One, I don't do anything by myself. Uh, that whole apparatus of Air Force search and rescue is such a huge team requirement. And I had trained to do it. I'd gone through Kirtland and practiced it gone to the simulator and practice missions. That was my first time really actually in the air being part of that entire team of combat search and rescue. So I'm like, wow, this is great. And then the other of, there are just some barriers to flying or to doing certain jobs that we don't really think about. And it's not necessarily done intentionally. So those barriers aren't there on purpose to prevent they're just unknown until we discover them and speak up to share them. So I learned to start speaking up if something wasn't working for me. Whereas before I used to just try to make it fit. I'd force it to fit. I'd force myself to fit. Yeah, I definitely get that. Yeah. It's a so, perfect rescue story. <laughs> it is a perfect rescue story. But <laughs> Yeah, that, but that became my thing. So, you know, when I was an instructor in the 71st Rescue Squadron, we'd get a new female crew member, go through all their training, and I'd be like, hey, we're going to do some additional training. I'm going to share some things with you. And it would be those, those items that I wouldn't expect somebody who didn't look like me or wasn't built like me, because I'm also five foot three. So there's a lot of height things involved in there to show me how to do it because they'd never had to. It's just, how would you know if it hadn't been a barrier that you had encountered? So I'd start pulling, you know, whether it be a short male crew member or another female crew member to go, hey, here's some things that I figured out in the C-130 that this might help you do this better or easier or with a little bit less uh, attention. So you touched on hidden barriers a little bit. What's the biggest challenge you've faced throughout your career? <sighs> The, my, my standard answer that used to be trying to figure out how to go to the bathroom, uh, which I would say that partly as a joke and partly as the metaphor of there are certain hidden barriers out there that aren't necessarily because the standard is the required standard. It's that the standards were developed based on a population demographic of an earlier time, so the 50s and 60s. So I think my one of the biggest challenges you face is identifying both me personally that those barriers aren't necessarily there intentionally. I'm not, but at the same time, trying to find the voice and the correct manner in which to speak of, but we still need to address them. We still need to find them and address them because you'll see a lot in certain media when we start doing, you know, making a career more inclusive. 
whether it be a male majority career field trying to include um, more females, or if it's any type of other majority trying to you know, advancing diversity inclusion, you start getting the, the people that wanna go, oh, as long as we don't lower the standards. Well, there's that idea of trying to get people to understand and even myself to understand that the standard isn't necessarily a performance standard that's gonna be a barrier that you have to change. It's, a, you know, it's more of a condition standard, like the design of an aircraft to accommodate for different sizes of people because there are shorter people flying. Um, equipment standards for shorter people, for female bodies. I mean, finally it's 2021 and I'm super happy for the fighter community because the females that wear G-suits are going to start getting G-suits that are designed to actually fit them. So I think that has been a challenge of pulling myself back and identifying what some of those barriers are and helping be a solution, helping identify those solutions rather than just feel like I somehow had to do without. So the next generation has to figure it out too. I think that's good advice for everybody in the military. <laughs> I think it is. And, I, and, I, and I'm definitely not the person with all of the great advice, but I think that goes for any career that you choose. Um, military aviation, civilian aviation, maintenance. I mean, if you look at the numbers, um, I wanna talk about a, a certain majority career field, look at maintenance. So a lot of that, I worked um, in women in aviation with a woman who's down in Orlando and she heads up maintenance for United Airlines at that base. And she remembers when she first started working, she didn't have a bathroom. Oh my gosh. So, but the guys tried to figure out a way to, you know, whether it be putting a sign on the door to flip it when she went in to use the restroom. So it's, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of of things that we can do to try to find the way instead of sit back and go, oh man, this is going to be hard. I can't do this because of being able to flip that script and go, I can do this because I'm amazing. I'm going to do it. How do I find a way to fix that? It's great to see support from male counterparts in those situations too, whether yeah. they're giving you a Gatorade bottle or flipping a sign on a bathroom door. Exactly. Allies are key. Yeah. In any, in, any, in any career field, in any background that you have, allies are key. <laughs> 100%. So you're, you're married and yes. your husband was military, correct? Yes. How was it for you balancing your family life with your career? I would say the biggest thing that I had to get past is there's really no balance you know, finding that right balance, you'll hear it. And I agree with the idea, the concept of work-life balance, but it's truthfully, it's just priorities. And then accepting that a little bit more of my attention has to be given to this today. So there were periods of time where my husband knew, for example, taking command, he knew the next two years, he was going to be a slightly lower priority. And having those expectations out there, it's not that my family is going to be completely neglected. Just recognizing that I had a larger role to fill on my military career side. It wasn't that it was more important, but at the time it was the more critical priority. So there's finding those ways to go, you know what, I'm not going to be very good at A, B, and C this week because I'm going to focus on these other items, but I'm going to pick those up next week. It's being able to find that ability to prioritize and accept that you're not going to be great at everything. Because once again, like I learned in my first CSAR mission, you don't do anything alone. So it's amazing the construct of a squadron. What do you have other people? So as a commander, I learned, you know, I have a DO. I have a great DO. I have a first sergeant. I have a superintendent. I have flight commanders. I have flight chiefs. So you're really that balance of family and military career really only occurs if you start trusting the people around you and recognizing that you don't have to do everything. That's how we made it work. Yeah, I'm gonna take that advice for sure. <laughs> it's hard though, because we want to do so well 
and we start to talk ourselves into the idea of, oh, but if I don't do this, I'm saying I shouldn't have been the person. I think we read into our own decisions as far as how to prioritize a little too much sometimes. So it sharing like responsibility is important. Yeah. It seems like I see that a lot when women are deciding when and if to have kids. Yes. And the truth is, is you do that when it's right for your family. And maybe that's not the answer for everybody. Others, other people are able to find other ways to prioritize it and work it in. But you can find ways then, whether you're in a flying squadron or another job or some, somewhere in corporate, you can still find a way to do that, still be productive, still work. And I think that's a lot of, that's a lot of work that we still need to do. It goes back to the idea of, are we really changing a standard it's a critical core standard to performance, or are we just changing something that's the old idea of what was required? We need to adapt it into what we need now. Because if I had gotten pregnant while I was flying, I would have been picking up every single additional duty <laughs> that the guys in the flying squadron didn't want to do so they could go out and fly. You can still find ways to, ways to make it work. So what advice would you give to someone who wants to do what you're doing? If you want to do it, try. Ask a lot of questions. Don't look at, like I was mentioning before, it's easy when you look at people that you admire or you have mentors, you see that end product, you see that finished product. So don't let that discourage you. So don't look at, I mean, I have some pretty phenomenal classmates from the Air Force Academy you know, Kim Campbell, who flew A-10s and she's in 06 and she's just done amazing things. You've got Samantha Weeks, who's a Thunderbird. So it's easy to look at these amazing female role models and go, oh, wow, but I'm not. But if you ask either of them where they started or asking me where I started, there's always something that we didn't have right that we had to learn or work harder to learn or ask people to help us learn. So my advice would be don't, don't look at your role models or your career at the, just the finished product. You don't have to necessarily be perfect when you're starting. You're just going to get there as you move along. So try it anyway and ask a lot of questions. Seek out those people and ask them the questions of what did you struggle with? I definitely see that when I watch Colonel Cook every day. I'm like, how will I ever get to where you are just so smart and able to process so much information and make decisions really quickly but yeah I never really think about you know the fact that he's been in for a really long time and has been doing this for a really long time you know he was a lieutenant too once <laughs> a long time ago oh so <laughs> and literally you went in a little secret when you're sitting around with your peers when you finally make squadron command because you're remembering your squadron commander who you thought had everything together <laughs> you sit around, look at each other and go, <laughs> when, when does that chip happen? When, when do they implant that data into our brain so we now know everything? <laughs> you still don't. You're still learning and doing. You've just gotten better at it. Each assignment, each person, each challenge, each failure. I've learned as much from my failures, if not more, than I have from my successes. So that leads to, so when you look at the people and you're saying, man, how am I ever, we were all lieutenants once too. <laughs> or I think it was, uh, I'm trying to remember who said it. I think it was Chuck Yeager. That one, at one time, all great pilots were terrible student pilots. I'm paraphrasing his quote, but <laughs> it is so true. <laughs> I think back of me in a tweet. I mean, I had pilot training classmates who are probably still to this day surprised I graduated. <laughs> And now look at you. You keep working. You keep working at it. Anything you want to do is worth working at it. So don't be discouraged if you don't have it right away. That'd be my advice. Don't be discouraged. Ask questions. If it's what you want to do, you got to try. The answer is no if you don't try. So 
the last thing I want to ask you is for you just to talk a little bit about the Mill U project that I mentioned in the beginning. It seems like such a great thing and a great uh, opportunity for these young girls to get involved. I, you know, I look back at, it's, it's easier for me to discuss it if I say how it started. And Colonel Jen Opke, she's in the Air National Guard right now. She is a former active duty H860 pilot. We grew up, we're about three or four years apart. And we didn't meet each other till we were Lieutenant Colonels. I was leaving, giving up command of the 347th Ops Support Squadron. And she was coming in to be the DO. We had never met before. But we were sitting around my pool, having a conversation, sharing stories about pilot training, being lieutenants, other, you know, first deployments, first mission, and recognizing that a lot of our experiences were the same. And one of the other things that was similar was who we got to go to for advice to ask some of these questions of how do you do this? And neither of us are afraid to ask a question, but that doesn't mean everybody is comfortable with that. So we decided we wanted to in some way, shape or form, give better advice than we got or put that advice out there in a way that somebody who maybe doesn't know how to even formulate the question yet can try to go find it. So we started a blog and we use the word milieu because it's you know a person's societal environment it's your social environment on the project being we want to kind of change that social environment so that we're starting to think of you know different societal norms i mean it's a generational thing if you look back at the wasps they were a completely segregated female aviation unit now we're a completely integrated aviation organization so it's it's getting through that and sharing those stories and communicating that advice and writing blogs about these people and highlighting who they were. And it grew into people calling us and asking for advice. And we were lucky enough to talk to a bunch of individuals that basically started helping us with the idea. We wanted to reach out to that next generation of pilots at like the eight to 12 year old range where they're like me, I want to do this, but I don't know where to find or how. And we just, we just wanna change some of those perceptions. We want to encourage more people to do things that might be outside of the societal norm, if that's what you want to do. And we're gonna be here to help guide you through it if we can. So we, we use the tagline, grow her wings. And that could apply to, I always say that fly like a girl. I look at that as like Nike slogan of just do it can apply to anyone. Grow her wings can apply to just about anyone, anything, whether you want to be a pilot or whatever it is you want to go do is we want to find the way to connect with those girls to help them grow their wings, help them find that everything that they need to achieve what they want to do is already right there within them. They just have to figure out how to, how to use it. Grow Her Wings is also the name of your podcast, right? Yes, which is, which is fun because we get to talk to people that are incredibly successful or have paved way in their careers to get them to share their advice. And I just recently got to interview Samantha Weeks, so my, my classmate that was a Thunderbird. And it was just cool to hear her share her story because that's the other part of it. Grow Her Wings is, you know, we talked about, you see that final product, it's kind of unpackaging that where you started and how you got there so that young girls, young kids in general and their parents can watch and listen and see how they can maybe guide through to get their kids to grow their wings. I don't wanna ask you this, but Colonel Cook is making me. <laughs> yes. When are you gonna have us on uh, Grow Her Wings to talk about moody women in aviation? Oh, how about the next podcast? Oh God, <laughs> I'll make him. We definitely will because we can, we can discuss what you're getting ready to do and maybe even have a follow-up of how it went. If it, if it goes well. <laughs> it's going to go well. I think that's another one of those things that's easy to do. I mean, with Jen and I, when we looked at Malou Project and she describes it in more succinct terms than I do. She's very good at distilling things down to the correct words. I'm a, I think out loud kind of person, but 
you, you look you look back at that and it's all about, it's easy to think, oh, this isn't gonna go well. Maybe only five people will watch this segment, but 40 are gonna listen to this and 500 are gonna do this. That's, I wouldn't worry so much about that. Being out there, getting things presented, seen, making it accessible. You have no idea who might check something out that day and be inspired or see something that inspires them or encourages them to push outside their comfort zone. So it will go well because you're doing it. Well, thank you. And thanks for agreeing to do this interview today. I think it's gonna be awesome. Absolutely. Thanks for letting me share a little bit about my story and hopefully pass on a little advice to anybody who's looking at pursuing the same thing, whether it be military or commercial aviation or any job you want to do. Absolutely. I have to call. <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't find the music.